Yeah. Okay. Does someone have a different translation? And that's fine. I just want you to hear it from different translations. Here's All right, uh, there are a few things here that I want you to get from this passage of Scripture. And I want to preach a sermon to you, just so I want to hit them very um, if you, How many preachers do we have in this room? One, two, three, four. You'll have some great sermonic outlines uh, or ideas, I promise you, in these classes. And if you're, you teach Sunday school or you'll have some great ideas too. Um, but here are some ideas I want to throw at you from the passage. When we do apologetics, we must be Christ-centered in our apologetics. And we see this, in, and by the way, the lines there, if you want to take notes, and there's not enough lines. But sanctify Christ as Lord. When we do apologetics, we have to, we have to understand this, that Christ is the center of everything that we do. And if Christ is Lord, now, uh, this set of and some translations it says honor. Okay, I do like the the word sanctify or set apart. Word, because when we do apologetics, and not just apologetics, but everything that we do, we have what we do. Apologetics. This is important because, well, we show is Lord in our life, and. It, when we do apologetics, by not doing apologetics, this is a way, and by the way, you're accountable since you've read this verse, we're looking at it, now you're accountable to display Christ's Lordship in this way, okay? So by failing to do apologetics, you are not showing the Lordship of Christ in your life in this way, and we're going to define apologetics. But that's important. So our apologetics must be Christ-centered, and this is because we, this is how we set Christ as Lord in our hearts. Secondly, our apologetics must be vigilant. We must be alert. We get this from always being ready. This is all from verse 15. Okay, always be ready. Also, our apologetics must be consistent with what we believe in or the hope that is within us. In other words, our apologetics, we're not defending or supporting something that we don't believe in. That, 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 that would be weird. Okay? So we are defending something that is consistent and coherent with what we believe But also if we back up to verse 3, this in the context here is about suffering. And one of the reasons we not want to defend their faith is because of fear of persecution or suffering. And in this context, we see that that is never for martyrdom. Although, you know, that, that's a maturity issue. But under great persecution, we must be willing to sanctify or set Christ apart as Lord in our hearts and to defend the gospel, defend the faith. Look at And who is there to harm for what is suffer for the sake of righteousness and do not fear their intimidation. God will bless you when you defend the faith in the right attitude. And by the way, without this, do apologize. apologetics must be done with gentleness and respect. Okay? toward those that we are, are, are speaking with. I will say that three always okay, centered in your apologetics. You always need to be alert and vigilant. But it to 
always and the reason why I say this sometimes we need to be strongly assertive and we we don't want to we never want to but what I'm times when Jesus used apologetics that was sarcastic but comes to the forefront but that most part, we need to be respectful. If not, we that's the, the antithesis of this. Sometimes the person may not see your gentleness, your, they won't be able to discern your gentle heart, but God to discern your humble heart, okay? They won't sense this humility because you, as Jesus made a whip, and he's discussed the issues and problems are in the. Uh, there is a defense, though the word apologia is not being used. So let's move on to what is apologetics. And uh, apologetics, this English word apologetics is a transliteration and not a translation. You need to know that. It's from the Greek word, which is a legal term, apologia. And it's mentioned in the Bible uh, in the New Times. Now here's a way to the letters in apologia. There should be eight letters, if not. And that's how it's used. In now that's the noun form, the and so I may be pronouncing this wrong. Hello, Gilma. And it's times. And ironically, there's 11, I don't have that word up there, Apollo, Gilma. The verb is it's 11 letters in it, so that's an easy way to remember that. Okay? And what this word basically means is defense. A defense. Now because of the context and what we're talking about, this is a defense of the Christian faith. But the word itself could be a defense of Islam, a defense of Mormonism. A def you can have, a, th there are Jehovah's Witness apologists. It simply means defense. But we're concerned about uh, defending the, the gospel, defending the Christian faith. That's what we're concerned about. All right, and in your outline there, uh, under number two, you could look at it. There's some reasons for apologetics. Perhaps that's the way I should have listed it that way. Reasons for apologetics. Well, for, it may be surprising to you, but apologetics is just as much unbelief as it is. All Christians are to be obedient. Teaches apologetics. Second uh, Corinthians chapter ten verse and Christians are to be obedient, bringing everything to the Lordship. Says we destroy arguments and every lofty <coughs> opinion, knowledge of God. Thought kept in Christ. This is one of an attitude and a motive for doing a glorify. I'm a little ahead of myself there. Number two, apologetics helps Christians grow in their faith. It helps them to know what they believe and why they believe what they believe. The distinction I believe would be under theology and why you believe it. Maybe. They, they blend here, does both apologetic that, okay? And so I believe and why are able to defend. Um, also, apologetics helps a believer in this way. It, we do battle with doubts, right? Have you ever battled with doubts in your life? That's, 
we do. And apologetics helps us uh, to uh, grow. One. Apologetics helps to strengthen one's assurance in the scriptures, but also in backing back up to the other thing, in your doubts. It helps you go through. Uh, number five, all truth is God's truth, whether it be from natural revelation or special revelation. And now I'm playing back on the verses that Channing read. How does this tie into how it helps the Christian? Well, it is our job as uh, defenders of the faith to see all that truth out there is God's truth but Christ center of our is the apple and so we're to glorify Christ all truth is God's truth but all that truth in some way will glorify God and Christ is Lord over all that truth and so we we have to learn and grow in our sanctification to see how we can glorify God with this truth. Uh, now, it may, it's impossible for one person to accomplish that. And so we have Christians glorifying God in their field and their discipline and uh, geneticists and biologists and zoologists and all this. And, and so as a church, as a body of Christ, we are fulfilling this. And as individuals, we do the best we can, <laughs> you know, to do this. All right? Any comments there? Mate, anything else that you see that I have put on here that apologetics can do for believers? How about this? It helps to strengthen one's worldview. Worldview. Definition of a Elaborate on. Okay. All right. How you understand the world and the world. It's a good concern. Many, many you a person's uh, one's noetic thing that you know in life, past, present, you know, uh, and present, everything that you've experienced in your world that in formulating your, a belief system that the questions from why you're here, where you're going, you know, questions that, that, that are beyond, you know, things like that. And so, genetics helps a person form and strengthen a consistent and coherent worldview. Because to some degree, we all have inconsistencies. I don't care how great a thinker you are. Everybody has blind spots. Apologetics, in the Bible, will help you be more consistent. And when the Bible is not a, all right, it's not a, a, not what it is, but you can learn how to defend your faith from things in the Bible. Yeah, we'll get to that when we yes. get to presuppositionalism. Yeah, we'll, yeah, okay. That's they, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's okay. A connection. Yeah, there's definitely not a separation. Yeah, there will always be a connection, always. And when we get to the second page in the outline, I think everyone uh, connect with everyone in the class. So it also helps Christians think better and more clearly and more holistically. Just in the world they live in, uh, they ever met a weird, just be, okay, I, I've met strange New Agers and, you know, people like this, and you uh, I, I, I heard just the other day, a professing Christian lady, monster king. Monster can, and from that monster can, she's proving that Satan is is behind this and selling the monster can because in the monster can, if you look at it, each it looks like vav 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 yeah, and and you know, and so you look down here in the word monster, you see the cross, and 
uh, the, you know, it's an upside down cross. Well, it's not upside down until you drink it. And so when you drink it, it's a, you know, and all this. And she's, and it's like, this lady's a Christian. She sounds so weird. And she needs the hermeneutics class, you know, and how to, and the authorial intent. You know, what did the author intend? Well, studying apologetics helps you not to be so weird. It really does. <laughs> Uh, more ba- <laughs> bad English, okay. But, you know, it helps you to think better without taking a philosophy class. Is philosophy sinful? No, study of wisdom. It's a study of wisdom, but it's God's wisdom. Man will lead you down a. All right. Now, it, words at this point, because in the Bible, we, there's many places where the word apologetics is not used, like seven, but there's apologetics going on. In, the, in wisdom literature in the Bible, literature where philosophy is not used, but the practice of it is the book of Romans. Some syllogism is there. So, yeah, there is wisdom and there is love for wisdom in the Bible. So, so I was, I'd answer that that way. Um, but always, when it talks about f- uh, bad philosophy, it's referring to man centered philosophy. Okay, thank you for Okay. Pre-evangelism and evangelism. This is a good purpose for apologetics. What do we mean? What do you think by pre-evangelism? The groundwork uh, before you actually try to come in and preach the gospel, you got to know, like you said, what worldview they're coming from. And since you guys elaborated, like I guess there's secular atheist worldviews and hmm. uh, kind of things you have to. Uh, how you're Good, very good point. And that, and that suffice. That, that's, uh, some people are with me. Divorce it completely. All apologetics is evangelistic. pre evangel I think of Getting into uh, semantics for but uh, I say here evangelism, all those apologies. Uh, some would not use pre evangelism. I'm okay with it. My youngest son in law is part of here at his church, uh, Jeff Simmel. He, uh, he was an agnostic and atheist, not a not a um, aggressive atheist like some have done, but uh, I asked him what what was the deciding thing or one of the, the turning points. He said someone handed him a book uh, by it's mere Christianity. Good one, by the way. Okay. It, it's kind of the way of sometimes before you can build up, you gotta take something down. Sometimes apologetics serves that purpose is oh, there's rocks in the road. We can't pave yet. We gotta get the rocks out of the road. So we're gonna move away. Whether it's an, an emotional barrier or a quote unquote perceived intellectual barrier or misinformation about actually what Christianity stands for. That's that's a lot of sometimes. Mm-hmm. But it's it's trying to get those things out of the way so you can clear the way for a clear presentation on the gospel. It is an uh, interpretation commentary. Read. 
you know, bringing every thought captive, bringing down the, you know, tearing down strongholds. Um, uh, we expose them, okay, and uh, we we play the view their world. Show them how it crumbles before. Right, and so then, come around. Then why apologetics? If the natural man will not understand, they can't understand. That's right. It's a means by which God does this. Now you're you first, and then you. That's right. I was just going to say what you said, which is, which is, which is, we don't we don't decide which natural man is un, is unreachable by the Holy Spirit. That's right. That's right. That's right. We, we, yeah, you have introduced something that would be very easy for me to chase after a rabbit. And we're kind of going to get to this on the, on the second page. Oh, but No, no, no. no. It, we, we'll go back to that, but in about uh, five, to, oh, about uh, in 10, 15 minutes we'll be there. Turn over to the next uh, page in your outline. Apologetics. We, we come with respect. <laughs> has to do and really also loving um, I'm reminded uh, when I was in college I took uh, a Jan term karate class notes that Well, if not, it is still kind of be in that syllabus. If it's, the, yeah. And by the way, the notes that I, I did make a couple, a little different from the original one that came out, out over the. But it's essentially the same. Okay, so we're under motivations for apologetics. You know, why do you want to study apologetics? Why do you want to do apologetics? Well, it's scriptural. God asks us to, but we need to do it with an attitude of love and humility. Um, I, I remember uh, in college uh, have, taking a karate class, and we were, we were in the dressing room, and uh, after the first session, and uh, somebody asked a question, well, why did you take this class? And it went around the class. Well, I took this class because I wanted to get more limber. I'm stiff, and another person said, well, I want to take this class because I want to get in shape. I'm out of shape. And I never forget this guy, tall, lanky guy named Seth. He said, I want to take this class because I want to kick. <laughs> he wanted to fight. He wanted to be able to whip people. And um, that's not the reason. <laughs> no, that's not the reason to take apologetics is to beat up people. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and sometimes, it, how many of you have ever had a Mormon or Jehovah's Witness come and knock on your door and you either say, no, I'm a Christian, leave, or you say, oh, sure, come on in. <laughs> Let's put on the gloves. Well, neither one of those are right approaches. You, because if you send them away, I promise you, I know what the Jehovah's Witnesses are saying and the Mormons. And they're saying things, oh. They are. They're not. Or they're haughty. They think they do. Yes. And they do pray. So, but uh, the, the point of the matter is if you send them out running, you've turned away a wonderful evangelistic opportunity. You really have. Uh, and, but if you invite them in and just invite them in to beat them up, then that's very arrogant and prideful. And that's nothing. It, it's really better 
just to humbly and politely say, you know, we're, we're come back. At, I'm not really prepared for, you know, next session. Better to send them until you get your heart right. All right. The average person in our church should not let them in. We'll look. I've had I have back and forth, and I I I, I would say that, but on. Like that, and, and, you are not. Yeah, and you need to be. there may be. Uh, let me say some things that may challenge that at the end of the class. But I, I don't disagree with that. I, I don't disagree with it. I, I just want to give some, uh, maybe some considerations. All right. Of um, engagement. Do's and to be seven, maybe. Um, all right. Uh, other motivations for apologetics uh, besides not beating up the people uh, uh, not to impress people but to humbly disciple people. In other words, you're teaching uh, apologetics not just to unbelievers but to believers. You're teaching them how to share their faith and to defend their faith. So that's a motivation to want to learn apologetics and to do apologetics. It's part of discipleship. Um, also, uh, you don't want to do apologetics to elevate the Christian religion above all other religions, although it is the only true religion. There's true religion and false religion, and Christianity is the only true religion, and every other religion is a false religion. But Christianity is a religion. You don't want it to get saved. No, you repent and believe in Christ. It's a religion. If it's all religion, um, that's your motive in apologetics is not to elevate Christianity. Your motive in apologetics is to elevate Christ and to be Christ centered in your argument. You believe that. So if you elevate your religion, Christ with that. I think we have to be apologetic. We're not dialogue. What you mean by not equals? Uh, we, we not um, a relative. We don't have the relative definition of truth. Well, I'm right and you're right. You know, and we're just sharing and learning from one. No, we don't. We don't do that. Right. Good. Thank you for. And by the way, I use some common understanding. Okay. So if I say something like dialogue, respond like brother, uh, so that we for, so that there can be some clarification on what I don't mean. Uh, I I was in seminary at Beeson Divinity School when we had a speaker come, and I asked him the question because he was about uh, different faiths. I was disturbed that I had this in, in the and I said, I asked a because we live in a postmodern world what must we um, Line logging with these other faiths from, and um, be brief because I have a class coming up. Because he had a tendency, you know, liberal. When go on and on and on, and when he's done, you don't know what he said, you know. <laughs> so, uh, but so when I, I don't mean truth. To heaven, they have a way to heaven. No, I'm just saying. Uh, talk with them like a human being created in the image of God and do it with respect. Okay? That's the way I mean. All right. All right. Under types of apologetics. The first one there is evidential or an evidential list. 
Now, what I'm going to do, because you need to know this, um, uh, all methodologies do overlap to some degree. I, I, and there may there is always some people that would disagree with that. Uh, but the truth is, when you're when you're talking about these different methodologies and approaches to apologetics, um, they're not miles apart. Especially even with the first two, evidential and classical. Th there's a lot that's just really a lot of it that overlaps. And if you've read Cowan's book on five views of apologetics, anyone read that book? Okay, uh, the evidentialist position guy, uh, Herbermoss, says, well, you know, the classical guy, he's basically holding my position except for this. You know, he's, you know, and he gives thumbs up to the classical position. And the classical position says, you know, he's basically saying what I'm saying, you know, and he thumbs up, you know, with exception of these things. So these methods do overlap, so I'm going to make some general statements uh, that are truisms, okay, about these approaches help you to make these distinctions without going on and on and on and on, all right? An evidentialist focuses on the factual verification of the Christian faith or Christian claims. If the Bible is to be taken seriously, its factual claims must be investigated with things like history, archaeology, biology, geography, anthropology, all these things, okay? That's the evidentialist approach or evidential approach. Focuses on facts. So, evidentialist, nothing but the facts, all right? Uh, one of the uh, scripture passages they may use, and by the way, again, a classical apologist could come in and say, you know, that passage that actually supports my view better than your view. <laughs> or a presuppositionist may say, no, that passage proves my point better than yours. Or, or um, uh, a fideist may say it supports my view better. But they would use a view, the evidentialist, like 1 Corinthians with this evidence of an empty tomb, or go to the gospel. See the empty tomb? See the eyewitnesses? See these things? Okay. Now the classical, oh, by the way, some good... Uh, just, just a question. Mm -hmm. Crime, you know, murder, 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 murder. Sure. Josh McDowell would be a good evidentialist. Uh, John Warwick Montgomery would be a good evidentialist. Uh, um, evidentialist. Uh, Gary uh, Habermas would be a good evidentialist. I, I don't like this guy, but he, he does say some good things in this area, but I, I think he, he's a... Well, Clark Pinnock. You know who Clark Pinnock is? He's an evidentialist. I don't... Uh, see there? Okay. You don't like him either, do you? But he does say some good things. Yes, yes. But that's a, that's a rabbit. Let's don't go... Clark Pinnock, uh, I'm just saying he's an evidentialist. Don't hate the position because of some people who hold it, okay? Um, anyway, but evidentialist uh, Josh McDowell is a good, Gary Herbermoss, great uh, orthodox evangelical Christian, believes in the authority of Scripture. All right, uh, classical apologists uh, would focus more on reason. Now, again, the evidentialists say, well, we're not irrational. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, so... But I'm just saying reason would be the focus of the classical apologist. An example would be they would use all, they would start with arguments like the cosmological argument uh, from cause, um, the teleological argument from design. We don't want to get into this, it'd take too long. But they would use people like Norman Geisler is one of the, the uh, defender of this. R.C. Sproul is a defender of this. William Lane Craig, uh, so even though he seems to be a little bit more venturing into the integrationist, um, but he is uh, classical as well. At least he used to be. I think he, he's probably more borrowing from everyone now. Yes, sir. Mm 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I could. Right. Yeah, I, and I, that, that's true. I would not disagree with that. That's not a. It's not a false statement to say that, and, and that is true a, a lot with because the classical would say, it, it, it's wrong to presume, and you can't. Um, you have to use. I'm thinking of their arguments against presuppositional uh, people, and they said you can't assume where people are. That's not fair. To you, you have to prove it for them show them uh, what you're saying, demonstrate it for them, give arguments and uh, proofs uh, for, uh, give them in God, and that's philosophical. And then a lot of times they will go to, they, they would they definitely want to go to the Bible, but they may not start with the Bible. So that, I think that's a true and fair statement. So that they, they do want to, they do believe in the Bible. R.C. Sproul is an inheritance. He, uh, what was he on and so was Norman Geisler on the, the Council of Biblical Inerrancy. They are they are strong in that, but they don't you know go there Probably first. You start with this philosophical connection that you have with all, that's common to all mankind. Mm -hmm. That's the philosophical argument to right. move evidentially and then mm -hmm. read the scripture. Mm -hmm. And that leads us well the 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 fideist, and by the way, uh, Martin Luther and Soren Kierkegaard is uh, proponents of this, or fideism. Uh, they focus on faith. Fide is a Latin word for faith. And uh, so they focus on faith. They reject all of these other approaches. They reject them. They reject reason and evidence. Now, not all fideists would reject them with the same intensity. But it seems like this particular group has more enemies even than the presuppositionalists. Yeah, a question? Yeah, but the funny thing is, is that other positions call, say that the presuppositionalists are guilty of this, that we are uh, fideists. That's like the classical. What? Uh, he would be between evidence and uh, classical, b both of those. Given that Martin Luther is the reason we're not Catholic today, uh -huh. I have difficulty criticizing the fetus approach. Okay. It, it created the Reformation. It made us what we are. Yeah, that, that, yeah uh, he can have a biblical understanding of soteriology and how faith fits there. We'll get us, I think, in the say we're going to talk about reason and faith, but in a nutshell, let me say this. It was right, 100% right in soteriology and faith alone in Christ alone. And how he divorces it from words, the way he saw faith in this particular is that he pitted it as reason, and it's not. That's where he's wrong. It's not an enemy of reason. No, and that's where, where he needed to be corrected. But, but no amount of reason will, will achieve faith. Yeah, and no one disagrees. Wait, wait, wait. Actually, some classical would disagree with that statement, but in the end... Yeah, in the end, in other words, when a person, and we have to go back to Pastor Jim's statement, reason is a means by which God brings us over. In other words, to put it this way, faith is not contrary to reason. It is, a, it is, it is, a, it is complementary to reason, okay? And supra, not irrational. We have Distinctions about faith. Well, so, it is a distinction to say that faith uh, agrees with reason, is not contradictory to it, but yet it goes beyond our rationale. That, that faith is supra in, in that. Every Definitely has to be a gift. We cannot operate unless it is a gift first. So we do it because we've been given it, 
and then and that exposing my reformed epistemology there with that statement but anyway uh, I, I don't want to jump you down but I think what he's trying to say believers and unbelievers have a faith starting point a faith in certain yeah. and that's one reason why Rob Bowman defends that position in that because the, the, the fideism uh, is the weakest of all the f uh, apologetical positions because of what they're saying but it also has the single strongest point that the other positions are ignoring and I think it's what you're touching on and it's what Rob Bowman in this book says guys we have to accept that in this aspect this is where Luther and Soren Kierkegaard are right okay it, it, faith we faith is very important matter of fact when, that's one reason why I had all of y'all share your testimony and uh, very few of you said none of to me into you know it was conviction it was those those sort of things that's that's faith coming by the word of god that was for this position the word of god <coughs> the positional relation on the Word of God and I would say logic it is rooted in epistemology now what is epistemology someone tell me what epistemology is let's let's narrow it down for the since we're Christians and this is a Christian apologetics class uh, we're concerned with the Christian theory of knowledge um, presuppositionalism is a belief that is held the presuppositionalist says this going back how do we get back to left um, and they would use verses and it's people like Francis Schaeffer even though he was an integrationist he was a uh, had a lot of presuppositional with him as Cornelius Van Til Greg Bonson uh, Ronald Nash under Gordon Clark, that kind of pre there are three kinds of presuppositionalists. You have the, uh, the um, uh, Cornelius Van Til. Everybody begins with some presupposition. Everybody does. Everyone does. The atheist has a presupposition, and the, and 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 anyone who says that they don't have any presuppositions they don't know themselves very well. Everyone has presuppositions. Yeah, and that is their presupposition, that they don't have any presuppositions. So everyone has presuppositions. And here is why I am a presuppositionist, although I think we need to integrate the strength of Martin Luther's position. We need to uh, integrate the strength of the classical position and the evidential position. But here's the thing. You can be a presuppositionalist and you borrow from them it's not that you deny them. It's just that you, you put the Word of God as the authority over the evidence. The Word of God has authority over, the, over empiricism, uh, over the things that you see, hear, feel, you touch, all these things. It's the Word of God interprets our experience, not vice versa. So, now, in saying that, uh, Josh McDowell, he would say the Word of God is authoritative, but I would just simply say, but my apologetics is also showing the authority of God's Word first. And in Genesis 1-1, uh, it says that God created the heavens and the earth. It doesn't try to prove God. It just states that He is. So I have a, a presupposition that everyone, to some degree, believes in God. Atheist, agnostic, the Bible says a fool has said in his heart there is no God. And that's not an intellectual fool, it's a moral fool. And so the reason why they're atheists is not because they're stupid, but because they're morally resistant. They're denying. That's, that's the idea of Psalm 14.1. The fool has said in his heart there is no God. But he's, clever. Has, but he's not an atheist because of his intellect. He's an atheist because of his morality. Okay. And uh, but I've never met a stupid atheist. 
So that's why Romans one is a good passage. And Romans one, uh, they are without excuse because of the clear light of creation. Now in summing this up, um, I have 50 seconds left to go, and so I'm, ne I'm not going to be able to do that to sum up John Frame's proof, evidence, and offense. So let me just say this real quick. Proof, that is, the apologist should seek to strengthen Christians by teaching them the logical and biblical basis for the Christian faith. That's in 2 Timothy 2, 24 through 25. The defense and offense, or to put it another way, negative and positive apologetics there, this is the broad scope of how the evidentialists and classical and uh, uh, the presuppositionalists can do apologetics. You can do it defensively or offensively. I'm going to say goodbye to the tape and uh, continue on with you. So.